Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. I'm Richard Walensky. This is KPFA's Bay Area Theater podcast, featuring stage reviews, along with extended versions of interviews heard on Arts Waves on Cover to Cover. My guests are Suze Allen, who is the director, and Richard Fouts, who is the playwright of The Birthday Lottery, a play at Z Space, coming up this weekend, March 29th to April 1st, only four performances. Z Space is located on Florida Street in San Francisco. For more information, you can go to either zspace.org or thebirthdaypartyplay.com. Richard Fouts, you've been working on this play since 2009. In 2009, I was listening to NPR, and Robin Young came on and was interviewing author Dennis O'Neill. And it was the 40th anniversary of the draft lottery uh, in 2009. And Dennis O'Neill had written a book called Whiplash, which chronicles his life at Dartmouth during the 1960s. And uh, in, in his book, he has a chapter where he details the night of December 1st, 1969, which was the first draft lottery since World War II. And as I listened to him describe that night about these numbers being pulled one by one over this excruciating 90-minute period, birth dates were drawn out of this bowl, and that became your draft number. And it was such a compelling story that I thought, this really belongs on the stage. There are, what, four male characters, one female? There are five male characters and one female. And then Colonel Omar, uh, if you count him, uh, is the sixth. How did you come down to those five characters? Well, I based them on my own fraternity brothers, and that's how I created these characters. It takes place in a fraternity house. And fraternity houses have lots of members, so I knew I couldn't write a play and have 70 people on stage. So I picked five that would represent different personas. Then you brought in another character, a woman. The president of the fraternity house is a guy named Mike, and his sister, Linda, is sort of a regular at the house. Uh, They both go to the same school. It takes place at the University of Pennsylvania. So she's sort of a friend of the brothers of Beta Theta Pi. How old were you at the time? I was 16. So you just watched it from afar. I did, but I was so close to the age, and and I had a brother who was 19, so he was right in the radar, and I had several male cousins that were either 19, 20, or 21. So I remember listening to this and saying to my dad, well, I'm, I'm okay, right? And he said, oh, no, this war will go on for years. And there would be one a year, a new lottery. Yes, there year. was one in 69. There was another one in 1970. They skipped 71, but there was one in 1972, and that was my year. What number were you? Do you 95. Remember? Never got there. Yeah, the war ended shortly after. On my end, I had just turned 19 a few months before. Most of my friends were the same age as I was, and all of us were scared about what would happen and trying to figure out, okay, if our number is low, then what do we do? So for me personally, it was a terrifying experience. I remember it. The thing about Vietnam is that young men were drafted as early as the middle 60s, but it was typical. It was, you know, poor people, racial minorities, and they happily went off to war when they were drafted. So Nixon thought, you know, we're running out of soldiers. Let's expand the draft, and I'm going to curtail college deferments. He ended graduate school deferments. And so what the Nixon administration really underestimated was the political backlash. What kind of research did you do on the play itself once you realized, I'm doing this? What did you do? I went out and interviewed people. I started to read books. I certainly read Dennis O'Neill's book, Whiplash. The subtitle of his book is The Day the Vietnam War Threw a Hand Grenade into the Animal House. So I particularly thought, you know, let's put this at an Ivy League school. He had gone to Dartmouth, and let's put it into a fraternity house. So I went out and I started to interview veterans, but more importantly, just men that had gone through that night, and especially men that had 
dodge the draft. And I interviewed a few dozen. And interestingly enough, being in the Bay Area, there's a big pocket of these guys in Santa Cruz. And so I headed for Santa Cruz and talked to a bunch of them there. What was their response? Very similar to yours, that it was just terrifying. And a lot of them said it just hit us by surprise because this is, uh, like as Suze likes to remind us, this was prior to the information age. It was the radio and the daily news were pretty much the sources. And so a lot of guys said to me, you know, I walked into the student union or I walked into my dorm and suddenly this draft is going on where they're calling birth dates one by one. And, and people were saying, what the hell is going on? And when it was explained to them, it just felt surreal. I was in Binghamton and the impression I had was virtually identical to that. And of course, I kept thinking, OK, if I have a low number, I weighed like 110 and 59. Can I lose 10 more pounds? I knew I was gay, but I hadn't come out of the closet. I hadn't done anything because I was only 19, and this was just around the time of Stonewall. So that was very, very early in that world when being gay was problematic. What do you do? How do you think of these things? And when you're in college, hoping to avoid the draft, it becomes very scary. Now, there's some of that in your play, right? There is. Because after December 1st, 1969, that's when the anti-war movement really kicked into high gear. There'd certainly been a movement before then. But, but now you had UC Berkeley, Columbia, Michigan, Ohio State. These were really the colleges and universities that were sort of the epicenter of the anti-war movement. And after that, there became this underground of lawyers and physicians that would help guys try to get deferments. Uh, it was all word of mouth, of course, because there was no internet. So you saw this tremendous effort on the part of young men to explore ways to avoid the draft, either through self-mutilation, unwanted children, getting married. Now, the marriage deferment was expired, so that wasn't going to work. Going to Canada. But what was particularly disturbing to me was how many men try these what I call self-mutilization techniques to, to make themselves unsuitable for war. What were those? Well, there was one guy who shot himself in the foot with his dad's 22 gauge shotgun, shattered his bones. Uh, there was a story of another guy uh, that stared into a sun lamp, practically burned off both of his retinas before he was discovered. I don't want to give a spoiler alert, but there's another one in my play uh, where a guy you know mutilates himself in, a, in an attempt to get out of the war. Richard Fouts... You have this play, you're starting to work on it. And this is 2009, this is nine years ago. Now, you worked on other plays at the same time. There's one about Leonard Bernstein, correct? Yes, yeah, a comedy. I started this play, I started doing the research, and I, I probably researched and interviewed for a couple of years, and I thought, okay, I've got to start writing this thing. So I started writing The Birthday Lottery, and then I took a little break and wrote this comedy about Leonard Bernstein, and then I went back to The Birthday Lottery, and um, decided, okay, it's time to get a dramaturg involved here. And so that's when I met Suze Allen. I met Suze in probably 2015, 16. Sent her this play. She had been recommended to me. Then we got together, and the rest is history. We worked on it together for a year. She said, I like your play. I said, what do you like about it? And she goes, Richard, the sign of a good playwright is to create an insurmountable conflict or a conflict that feels, and, and you've got that in this. Suze Allen, how did you find out about the play? Did he just, like, email you or something? Yeah, he has a play about uh, FDR, and we had been uh, working on that dramaturgically. And he said, hey, I have this other play. Why don't you send it to me? I also am the Bay Area Dramatists Guild representative, and Richard was a member of Dramatists Guild. And so we have a lottery where we ask people to submit plays. And so he won the lottery for one night. So we did the birthday lottery as a reading. So a lottery got you in. <laughs> the lottery got the birthday lottery, yes. It was very well received, and we just went deeper into the play. And Richard started to send the play out. I We really talked about how timely it is, and now is the time. And it wasn't getting accepted, you know, new playwright kind of stuff. And I said, what if you self-produce? And, oh, that seems like a lot. After a while, when it wasn't happening, he said, okay, we're doing it. He's turned out to be a fabulous producer as well. 
that's how we made it happen. The rehearsal was amazing. Richard was doing rewrites on the spot for flow and for, you know, fleshing out little pieces of the character. It was in really good shape. But so that was a really fun process for us as well. And how long is the play now? Is it one act? It's a one act. It's 90 minutes. It's 90 minutes. So you have to kind of carve it into that shape, too, because that seems to be what's happening now. We don't have that many intermissions in new plays. Uh, Richard, why do you think that is? Well, I always say it's because of just ADD. Theaters pretty universally now say when they're taking new plays, 90 minutes, they prefer maybe four actors. You'll see now competitions for 20-minute plays, 60-second uh, plays. Definitely, you know, the days of Eugene O'Neill, Long Day's Journey into Night, those those kind of three-hour plays just aren't really being written anymore. Unless you're, uh, you know, Hamilton, theaters don't want long plays. With large casts. Well, I think part of that also is... With Broadway no longer being the end point, because if it's the end point, then you can have longer plays and you can have more people. But if the end point is going to be regional theaters, relatively small regional theaters, I think you're stuck. Well, the interesting thing is that I don't think it was about really about format for Richard or for myself. What we tried to work on and create was that the birthday lottery was about that long, you know, and so these guys are sort of in this cocoon place. They're very, 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 you know, the brightest and the best. They love their lives. We didn't want an intermission because we wanted the numbers just keep coming and they're just being affected by it. So their whole life is changing in this one moment in this place that has been a safe place for them. And they're trying to figure out what the heck to do about it. The 90 minutes without an intermission works perfectly for that. So the audience also has that feeling, too, of like, eh, when will it stop? <laughs> you know. Well, it's funny because when I submitted the play to Suzanne, it was a three-act play. And then she said, let's make it a two-act play. And then she said, let's make it a one-act play. 90 minutes, no intermission. Is it all real time? Pretty much, yeah. It's not exactly real time. There are a couple of breaks but it was meant to be that night. So, in other words, you're building up the suspense by keeping it that way. So mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a little bit more than just a technical issue because it changes how the audience is going to view it. Right. We want them to have the same feeling that those young men had, that the, the numbers just keep coming and you have no control over it. Once your number is called and one of the characters in the play... He's pre-law and he's researched all of this. He's been down to the draft board and he has all the information. So you've got these numbers coming in over the radio and then you have the men that get the low numbers saying, okay, what about this? And it's like, yeah, no, mm, probably not. It's very tense. And like you said, they're terrified. The play opens when the birthday lottery, the first number has been called. We're right there. We're right there with somebody who's facing going to war, who's really not cut out for it and really has a beautiful life. And, you know, college deferments are ending. And it just starts at this, this high point, And then it just gets more tense. We're many years later. There's a tendency to think of this in a historical framework. But what do you see, Richard, and what do you see, Suze, as the relationship to what's happening today? Well, I think first and foremost, it's a play about people's lives being faced with something that's traumatic and something out of their control. So it has this kind of long shelf life, but it is housed in the, the history of the Vietnam draft. So I think that people can relate to what these young men are going through, even if they weren't in the draft. When I presented the play to Suze, I said, you know, I don't want this to be a Vietnam play but rather a, a story about how these five young men are forced to face their own mortality at a very young age. And Sue said, fine, but, you know, it is about Vietnam. That is the catalyst. She said, in that case, then, this can't be a history lesson because I had a lot of facts and figures rolling off. And she said, this has got to be about the trauma and the drama of these young men and the various stories that come up in their personal lives and the futures that they had been looking forward to suddenly with the possibility of them being cut short. So she focused me on that part of the play 
and away from the sort of docudrama style. I'd like to shift gears for a second. Suze Allen, what is Three Girls Theater Company? Well, I was one of the co-founders with A.J. Baker and Lee Brady. We developed Three Girls Theater because gender parity at the turn of the century, not the last one, but the one before, it was like only 12% of women were getting their plays produced since then. There was a big movement underfoot nationally, and we really wanted to have a part of that. So we only produce and work on plays written by women, but of course we use men as directors and as actors. That was our big push. Are you still involved with it? I'm on a leave of absence, but I am still on the advisory board. One of the plays last season was written by one of KPFA's people, Kat Brooks. That's right. Yes, I love Kat. Where do these plays get performed? One of the things that we were very clear about is that we didn't want to suddenly invest in a theater space um, because then suddenly you're all about the finances. So we rent theater space. For instance, they're doing the play Disruption downstairs at Z Below right after they open the the following weekend after we close. And we've worked at um, Potrero Stage, which used to be Thick House. We worked there a lot. Before we move on to Richard's career, a couple more questions. I looked up your resume here, and you do a lot of writing and do a lot of editing and teach a lot of that and work with people. How does one become a dramaturg? I sort of stumbled upon it, being a playwright myself and being an editor for other kinds of work. I just discovered that I had a knack for helping people discover the heart of their play, and I studied a lot about dramatic structure. I taught playwriting for a long time, and so I just kind of naturally went into helping people help them figure out what they want to say, and uh, it just developed into that, and then I have my own private practice with that. Uh, Have you always been involved in theater? Yes, I have. Yeah, I started in uh, high school, and then I went to Emerson College in Boston, and I just kept going. I just love the immediacy of it. I um, especially am not a big technological person. I just really like people being in a space where they can hear people breathing and see what's going on, and that they actually affect the work that's going on on stage. It feels very vibrant and vital to me. Did you start doing acting at first? Yes, But I was always writing and directing, but I started out as an actor. So you've been writing plays all along? Mm -hmm. What about writing novels, things like that? I've done collaborations with people on works of nonfiction. I've written a lot of short stories, but I mostly what I put out into the world are plays. Where did the directing come in? I just have a vision for something. When I see it, I think, oh, we could do this, and that would really, um, that stage picture, that relationship, if, if this happened, it was just a natural progression for me. And I really love working with people. Again, it's sort of like um, being a dramaturg. I'm not a dictator as a director, so it was just like, what do you need to get there? What do you need to make this character real and truthful? I just have always loved that, and I also always could um, work on those minute places, but also see the bigger picture. And then you become involved, of course, with the casting as well. Exactly. Is it dramaturg or dramaturge? We, we dramaturgs <laughs> like to do the hard G at the end. Yeah, and whenever you say that word, people are like, you what? What is that? With the birthday lottery, what happened was you would work as a dramaturg, and then when you approached Richard about just producing it yourselves and getting it out there, you said, hey, I'll be the director. Yeah, I directed his staged reading that we did at the Phoenix. I just have a real affinity for the characters in it, and I really love, I I think Richard is just a natural playwright. I really love his work, so he picked me. So I just said, well, if you're looking for a director, I'm here, and he's like, oh, good. Yeah, it's been kind of symbiotic in that way. One final question for you, which Mm -hmm. is, um, what about film? Nope. I'm not a film person. Really? You like to have the audience? I've worked with people on, you know, getting their screenplays ready, but no, I really like the live, I like live theater. I like that experience. And Richard Fouts, so let's go back a little bit to you. Have you always been involved in theater as well? Not at all. I'm a theater goer. I've always loved going to the theater, but my background is in business. You know, I've been in corporate communications and marketing communications my whole career, but I always approached my job as storytelling whether I was writing a speech for my CEO or an earnings report or an annual report or a press release, I always told stories. And if you get people in my profession together, like when I go to just different professional association meetings, 
we're all writers and we've all got something going in the background, usually novels, not many playwrights. It was always my dream to become a playwright after I retired. And then I thought, well, what am I waiting for? Let's just do this now. And what was the first play? The first play was The Franklin Diaries, a working title, but it's, as Sue said earlier, it's this play about Franklin Roosevelt. It peers into how FDR made decisions. Act two is, uh, is his decision to intern Japanese Americans. Act one is his decision to have his medical records destroyed. And act three is between Eleanor and her daughter, Anna, after he's died. I sort of put that one on hold, and Sue keeps saying, you've got to get back to that FDR play, and I, I promise after this is done, I will. So you've got this, and you've got the Leonard Bernstein, but those are still in, quote, development. And then another play that Sue's just read called Dead Serious, about two female assassins. It's a dark comedy. Now, that had been a novel. I had started that 20 years ago as a, as a novel. But I found that what I really love is dialogue. So in my work, I've written tons of, you know, 30-second spots because of, of my work in advertising. And I've written lots of scripts for industrial videos, and I've written lots of speeches. And I thought, you know, I think I'd rather be a playwright, not a screen playwriter. I wanted to, to write for the, for the stage because I think there are things you can do in live theater that are just so magical that you can't do in any other medium. It's a great medium. Working with Suze Allen has been sort of like a graduate course in playwriting. I already knew the dramatic structure. You know, I, I basically knew the fundamentals of playwriting. But with the birthday lottery, lights up, they're in the lottery. And so it, the drama starts off immediately. And so working with Suze, she said, you know, you've got to maintain this drama. And you've, you've got a lot of the drama coming later. And you've got to move some of this stuff up. So she helped me restructure the play. She thought the uh, characters were great. The basic story was fine. But we just had to move some scenes around to keep the dramatic suspension moving so that it would constantly just grow. And then, of course, the classic dramatic structure, it's got a big you know, cliffhanger about halfway through, uh, and that, which then goes into a resolution. So... It was incredibly efficient to work with Suze Allen because I got so much, you know, so much education. And then, of course, she's also a director. So it, it, was, it was such a natural process to go from Suze Allen dramaturg to Suze Allen director. And I've learned so much about directing. Watching her, I know that I don't want to be a director after watching her direct. Why? You know, it's just, oh, it's hurting cats. You know, you've got these actors that have all got their own ideas, and they're all competing for attention, and they're all asking questions, and they're all saying, why is my character doing this, and why is my character doing that? What's fantastic about Suze, though, is, is she's a playwright. They always want to change lines, change words, or eliminate lines, and Suze will say, make it work. We're not going to eliminate a line just because you don't get it. You have to make this work. Now think about it. And this is how she worked with me as a writer is she never told me what to do. She never wrote it. She would just give me direction and then say, go off and do this. And she works that way with, with actors too. She doesn't tell them what to do. She gives them purpose and a reason. And she pushes back hard when they say, I don't like that line or I don't want to say that word or I don't want to say it that way. The line I hear most from her mouth is, make it work. Yes, I think because Richard is a new playwright and because we were doing some um, scriptural changes, and of course we wanted some feedback from the actors, so what you, you create is this, oh, yeah, it's the living playwright. He's right here. Well, you know, this word is sort of odd here. Do you think I – and it's like, no, 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 no. We're good with that. You know, I don't think that really works. It's like, no, well, then if you don't want to live with them, say it like you, you know, yeah. act it. You know, that presents its own problems because sometimes when, you know, the playwright is in the house and you do open up the rehearsal that's um you know and it's great these actors have been amazing sometimes where you have to say no it's this isn't group writing we're not going to change rich's whole play i mean we're looking for the holes in it that we didn't quite discover when it was a, a reading now that it's up on its feet and um, it's mostly stuff for flow and like well if he said that it doesn't really make sense because he said something else earlier that didn't tie into that. So we've been doing that kind of work. What about comedy in the play? What about jokes and laughter? That becomes all very problematic because you never really know until there's people out there to laugh or not laugh, right? Well, there's some levity in the play, and that's what I like about it. 
some of the antics that come out of people's desperation, you're laughing, but it's really not funny and you feel bad for laughing, but yet it is funny. We have those moments. So it's not just like this deep, dark, you know, jackhammer to the heart for 90 minutes. There is some of that that goes on. But when that goes on, you sort of have to have an audience to kind of get a sense of whether that's working or not, don't mm-hmm. you? Yeah. They're the other cast member. You bring them in and you find out what works. And then what works one night for an audience doesn't work the other night. That's Richard's next frontier as far as, you know, not going, the audience didn't get that. Should I change it? And it would be like, no. (laughs) Well, the reading, we got a lot of laughs at lines that were not even designed to get a laugh. That surprised me. And then the lines that were supposed to get laughs did, did get laughs. When I had this peer reviewed, I had other playwrights read it, other writers read it. My friend Marty Kine, who created a wonderful series called House of Lies, he read it and said, you know, dude, you've got to get some comedy in here. You have some, but you need to get a little bit more because these are frat guys after all. So you've got plenty of territory here. And he said something really interesting. He said, you know, this play is so dramatic. You need to get people good at comedy as actors. And I thought that was such an interesting piece of feedback. So we have a couple of actors that have done a lot of comedy. And it's turning out that comic actors make very good dramatic actors. The view of some is that to make it funny, you have to make it bigger. My view is to make it funny, sometimes you have to make it smaller. How do you look at that, Suze? Well, I just look for what's truthful. When I'm working with a character, does it come from the character? You know, some people are just... If they're over the top in their emotional delivery and the way, if they're flamboyant or uh, loud, then that's the way they would deliver it. But if they're not, if they're more subtle, out of the side of their mouth, if they're more sarcastic, we have a character in the play who's kind of a commentator. You know, something will happen and we'll be like, oh, yeah, so I guess if, and it's just funny what people really love about humor when it comes from the truth. And it is grounded in the character that you're not making it big if you're a very subtle person. It's like, so what kind of humor would you have? Just exploring that. I think that's important. Do you like working on new plays versus older ones, you think? I like both. I have mostly in the last uh, 10 years worked on new plays. But before that, I was mostly a director of dead playwrights. <laughs> but I, I like the idea. I really like the idea of working with playwrights who live in the Bay Area, because I just feel like it's very rich working with people that, you know, they live here, they work here, they have family here. And, you know, what is their experience? It shapes things. But I'm not opposed to working on plays that aren't new. Richard Fouts, so this play is coming up now, then what? Well, then I get back to my play about Franklin Roosevelt. That's really my priority. Have you figured out a way to condense the three acts into one? No. This play is meant to be three one-act plays, so each one could be performed on its own, but it's meant to be sort of an evening of one-act plays about Franklin Roosevelt. And how long are each of the acts? They are about 20, 25 minutes, so it's designed to, again, stay within that tight window of 60 to maybe 80 minutes. You could absolutely just run all three acts together. Have you ever thought of Fringe Festival? I have. In fact, Suze told me about Fringe Festival. Yes. And Suze, Alan, what do you have coming up? This is what I have coming up. I'm working on a play with Gigi Amber. It's called Frames, and we're working on it together. It's a play with music. And Larry Tassi, who is our stage manager, our sound designer, and our lighting designer, he's a composer. He's doing the music for it. And where will that be? We applied to the Fringe, and we didn't get in. It'll probably be another self-production because I can't wait. If something's ready, I just want to get it up, and I don't want to wait for somebody to say, oh, we'll do it. And if somebody needs a dramaturg, what is your website? Manuscriptmentor.com. The Birthday Lottery is at Z-Space, March 29th through April 1st. Z-Space is at 450 Florida Street in San Francisco, And for more information, you can go to zspace.org or thebirthdaylotteryplay.com.